Dan Foss. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Kuldeep Barma ji, uh, Minister uh, Dan Foss. Uh, you are requested to please start the, your uh, topic. I think we please give me the share content. Yes, yes. So I am, am I audible, sir, or to everyone? Yes, yes, sure. Yeah. Uh, 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 just to introduce, my name is Pramod Dalvi. I am uh, a senior manager uh, handling uh, business development in energy and oil and gas uh, in uh, Danfoss Industries. So here we are going to talk for next 20 minutes about reliable and efficient AC drive solutions in power plants. Uh, just to uh, give a short uh, glimpse about uh, where uh, the numbers are, like we are a group company of Danfoss Industries Limited, uh, which is a 6 billion euro company uh, headquartered in uh, Denmark. And we belong to uh, Danfoss Drives Division, who is exactly having a 25% share in the group company, which is 1.5 billion uh, euro. and 26.9 uh, million drives are already uh, in delivered uh, in during uh, our uh, era and then we have more than 35 million power modules have been uh, in the field and we have more than 1000 partner companies and plus we have a global presence in 100 countries we have sales and service offices in uh, 50 countries and then we have 10 factories. And uh, the one more major thing to be noticed is we are the first movers in 1968 uh, on the mass production of uh, VFD. So typically what we see uh, on the applications, which is uh, may, uh, you know uh, available in power plants for VFDs, we, we uh, segregate this into two areas. One is the BTG packages, that is boiler turbine and generator, and the others is auxiliary uh, plants, or what we call it as a balance of plant, where ash handling, coal handling, the new application is fuel gas desulfurization and water treatment plant. So what we see is major applications in BTG packages. What we have done is boiler feed pumps, IDFD fans, PSA fans, circulating pumps, cooling water pumps, ACC uh, uh, air cool condensers. And when it goes to uh, <clears throat> BOP, we are done uh, HSD pumps, air compressors, apron feeders, stacker reclaimers, uh, long conveyors, and their pocket feeders. So on the right hand side, if you see uh, the typical flow uh, diagram of a, of a power plant where uh, we have just shown uh, the pictures of the applications. And uh, <clears throat> what we want to communicate that we have a complete product portfolio for operating voltage 415, 690, as well as 6.6 .6 kV. What we see as a uh, configuration in LV is uh, 6 pulse and 12 pulse, uh, uh, active front end configuration and a lineup and with an active filter configuration. When it goes to MV, we have seen uh, 24 and 36 pulse uh, configurations is also available. Uh, coming back to the topic, uh, what are the recent market trends and uh, technologies? Uh, we, uh, we, we see uh, motor independence and uh, field bus uh, independence is a major uh, need of a customer uh, because a customer can now select any motor like um, induction motor, a copper rotor or a synchronous motor and then uh, Danfoss drives are uh, ready to, uh, you know, fit it for the any, any uh, type of the motor. Uh, 
similarly uh, we have uh, independency on the plc and the field bus system like you name it like profinet profibus powerlink ethercat device net all all this uh, field buses we can hook up to our drives so customer benefit here uh, he does not depend on any uh, supplier for uh, you know motor and uh, drive or you know, plc and a drive so this is the unique uh, mm, feature what we would like to communicate then uh, uh, speaking about ip configuration uh, we have almost uh, uh, starting from ip00 ip20 21 54 55 66 most stringent one is 66 where water resistance uh, drives are also there so this gives the flexibility to uh, customer that he can place motor either uh, you know um, <clears throat> drive close to motor or he can put it centrally also so there is no uh, you know we have drive solutions for every uh, situation and on environment also if you see on an operating temperature we can give from plus 50 to minus 25 so it's a very wide range and then uh, because of this ip uh, uh, protection we we can do uh, avoid the chokes and less cable lines and hence we can save the energy and also it reduces the uh, installation and maintenance costs uh, on a low noise operation what we see is like uh, if the emc uh, or irfi filters if they are not there in the drives it can create a negative impact on our sensitive equipment like plc and instrumentation so what uh, our drives are having c1 c2 built in uh, um, as an uh, you know uh, those filters are built in so if it is c1 then it is a residential category which is most stringent in hospitals malls and airports so which can cater up to 50 meters of screen motors and then you go to residential category c2 is also available up to 150 meters so due to this i think we our drives can uh, support up to long cable distance so no you don't need an expensive output filters which causes an uh, losses so hence we can improve on the efficiency part and this is a very important slide what we are talking about now is uh, danfoss drives are compatible to i two uh, classes uh, class of efficiency so if you see the standards like iec 61800 uh, 9-2 says about vsd and vsd plus motor wherein uh, danfoss complies to this uh, efficiency class i02 up to i2 and uh, the innovation what we have done in our drive is we have a temperature controlled cooling fans you know um, and then we have uh, the the switching pattern of the uh, agbt is uh, designed such a way that it will have a low loss and then we have specially designed uh, heat sinks and a dc reactor with a very low loss so due to this our overall efficiency is uh, very high and the losses are below 2% so customer is benefited uh, due to this because uh, uh, of the efficiency it is coming in next slide what is the actual benefit and our compliance is there to uh, highest uh, energy efficiency class which is i2 so this is one uh, example what we have uh, just taken uh, just in like uh, last slide i said 98% so if you see uh, we have picked up three frames like uh, 30 kilowatt 75 kilowatt and a 315 kilowatt and if you talk about uh, we, we are just saying the calculation basis like uh, operating hours in a year around 8400 and an energy cost uh, approximately seven rupees per kilowatt hour so if you see uh, the efficiency or a loss difference between repeated make or leading make and done for you can save almost 29,000 in for a 30 kilowatt VFD, almost 34,000 for a 75 kilowatt VFD AC drive. And if you, you will be surprised to see around one and a half lakh for a 315 kilowatt, which is approximately, you know, 15 to 20% of your capital investment. So this is a real impact on, uh, on your, the heat loss, what we have which is uh, more than uh, efficiency is more than 98 percent 
so just to summarize like uh, you need not ask a customer need not ask for a best efficiency in fact you should ask for a low heat loss and then uh, you know once we, then then they should evaluate on a, if you have a project of 30 40 vfds it will make a major difference and we also have an uh, ama as a uh, um, feature that is automatic motor adaptation which gives the best soft uh, shaft performance at the best efficiency so this is also unique feature then we have automatic energy optimizer so that will uh, be activated when the motors are run on partial uh, load it's a parameter so once you do that around 3 to 5% energy saving is just done because of these two uh, features on the in a then for vfd uh this is a uh, more of an engineering uh, uh, because what we spoke about uh, some features of uh, software features but this is about engineering wherein we have a unique feature uh, available in only than for size that we have a uh, different path of uh, hot air to be passed through from control side and uh, power side so when you do this kind of uh, internal arrangement Uh, with this uh, back channel cooling 90% of the heat can be taken away from the room and just for a calculation purpose we have done about 160 kilowatt uh, drive calculation so if you have about 3700 watt as a loss in 160 kilowatt with the formula uh, we can buy, we can see almost 41000 rupees we can save per year which is a 15% cost of an ac drive so this is when we are using it as a standalone so these are the real pictures of the back channel cooling uh, where we have two uh, provisions one is back in the fresh air can come from the back side and the top out and then uh, in another option it can be back in and uh, back out so both these options are there so in back in back out you can mount it on the you know uh, on a floor uh, like uh, complete the sink Uh, and then if it is a uh, back in back out then you can also have a stand alone so we are just showing the uh, real life feature this is a project we have done in chennai uh, water board coimbatore uh, where it was a lineup of panel and uh, uh, sorry and you can see Uh, the ducts are uh, um, uh, on the top side where it is taking heat outside the room so your cooling in the panel room is only required for uh, the 10% heat which is left out in the panel so you are operating uh, the capex also comes down the tonnage of ac also comes down and your opex is also coming down uh, drastically so wherein uh, whenever you are having a lineup of panel this is uh, very important uh, a feature engineering feature which a danfoss drives has and many customers have uh, in various segments are utilize this and now coming back to the reliability part now uh, <clears throat> we have spoken about efficiency but on the reliability part uh, danfoss offers uh, the pcb coating with the iec compliance like 60721 wherein uh, we give 3c3 coating as a standard like many of our uh, manufacturer friends who other drive manufacturer does not give they give coated pcbs but they do not give the uh, <clears throat> you know 3c3 as a standard or uh, 3c2 as a standard so what it does actually it does uh, protect uh, from pollution it does protect from moisture it does protect from dust thus the drive uh, lifetime is increased so in uh, actually these are all factory uh, Uh, this coating is factory coating done from finland or uh, Dan- uh, uh, denmark factory and all these components are heat- heated during the process to a very high value so this is where the um, uh, difference comes the like if somebody is doing this coating locally uh, it may not give the same reliability what we can get it through a factory uh, um, factory built to pcbs so this is an iec document which clearly shows uh, what are the uh, if you see left hand side what are the gases present in the environment and to a what degree so if you see the red circle chlorine for example if it is uh, if you, if you see it is 0.1 in uh, mg per meter cube in 3c2 coating but it is 0.3 so almost three times higher so a, a customer or a consultant has to look at it 
that uh, what are the gases present in my uh, environment and then accordingly they should select uh, most of the oil and gas and uh, petrochemicals uh, 3c3 is now a basic feature people are uh, already aware of the issues what are happening at site uh, because of this corrosion uh, many pcbs uh, are found with the holes uh, so that uh, they, and then there is a malfunction so definitely this is very important uh, and danfoss offers this as a uh, built in feature uh, coming back to next reliability feature what uh, danfoss drives has is uh, drive sync uh, this drive sync offers you uh, uh, flexibility to parallel the drives like if you are talking about large rating of uh, boiler feed pump or an id fan where where you have like let's say 700 kilowatt or a 1 megawatt motor so you can parallel this drive so what uh, we can do is in for a 1 megawatt motor we can parallel four numbers of 250 kilowatt and all this 250 kilowatt drives are running in parallel and in case of any challenge on one particular module the drive doesn't trip the system doesn't trip it will run on three modules or on a reduced load many times it is engineered like we engineer at a 75% or whatever percent which is a bkw of the application so that your application is not uh, affected so it's a very unique feature and uh, it is easy to maintain also because you can remove that module we can give the uh, a trolley kind of uh, engineering and then they, it can be removed and uh, then you whatever spare you have you can put it in service and this also can be designed for an online uh, insertion so <clears throat> another advantage is like you can also reduce the spare inventory because for a 1 megawatt drive if you have to keep then you have to keep 1 megawatt drive as a spare but here you have to only keep around uh, um, 25% of your spares so this gives a <clears throat> on a high power drive this is very popular uh, in cement and metal industries we are seeing this kind of requirements coming in power plants where the uh, applications are very critical like boiler feed pump and id fan Uh, so many consultants are started looking at this as an uh, one of the feature uh, now we are coming uh, back to uh, the the basic uh, infrastructure what danfoss has built in uh, uh, india so this is a real picture of our orgadam factory uh, and uh, it is uh, lead platinum based campus 50 acre campus and this was built uh, in 2014 or 5 to 6 years back and it is we are completely um, having our own 1 megawatt solar plant and then when we we have our own stp all danfoss uh, groups uh, drives uh, you know power solutions and cooling heating all other divisions are under one roof we have more having more than 1000 employees here uh, it's a big investment of 500 crore plus that time Uh, we have a full value chain we have an r&d we have sales and marketing people there we are manufacturing we have supply chain sitting there <clears throat> we have a certification of uh, ts16949 which is very stringent mainly for automobiles we have seen we have a environment simulation chamber this is very important where we when we do, we do uh, up to 250 kilowatt we do semi knockdown uh, type drive manufacturing so this is very helpful we have a chamber for uh, 70 degree and minus 25 uh, degree available at chennai now we have a drives lab now this drives lab is uh, what we our investment is we can load test up to 1 megawatt both 6 pulse and 12 pulse drives and also we can conduct an emc kind of a test we can do the ip test as i told you and we can do the brake test also for 700 kilowatt so many consultant like uh, and uh, end user like ntpc and eil and mecon insist on the factory testing full load temperature right so in such cases we we uh, we have done it and uh, we we have an enlistment from eil for 1 megawatt 690 volt which is they have tested in our factory last year so uh, such credentials are available with us on a factory test plus we can do the complete harmonic study like many uh, many uh, uh, large loads are having harmonic so we give a common active filter as a solution so therein we can simulate this harmonics in our factory and we can show the complete uh, compliance in our factory uh, in fat 
uh, and the next slide uh, is uh, we talk about uh, everything and then we we also need to service them so we have 24 by 7 service support available uh, across india we have a customer service center uh, who is uh, logging the calls and uh, we have a <clears throat> you know uh, sla to call close the call between for 24 hours that is response then we are storing all the service stocks across india for 24 by 7 service we have a site training module we have a drive pro module where we give after warranty services life cycle management and uh, thus we are owning the total uh, cost of ownership uh, now uh, coming back to uh, my last slide is a summary slide uh, which is uh, <clears throat> just to give a brief like we are a strong number two globally and also in India with an 18% uh, market share. Uh, our overall experience is uh, 50 years in drives uh, from 1968 and application more than 23 million now 25 million drives are installed across industries. In India, we are in uh, uh, there for 20 years now, so we are a reliable partner for many companies for 20 years. Then uh, we have a uh, solid experience of uh, active front end and harmonic solutions. We we have a COE. So what this uh, COE means, Center of Excellence, which is supporting uh, like segment managers like us and. Uh, on a technical uh, discussions and value proposition and business proposal. So we have such five COEs across the globe. India is one of them. And uh, as I mentioned, it is more than 500 crore investment and plus uh, 1,000 employees in uh, Oceani campus. Uh, we commit for 24 by 7 service. Uh, we have the lifecycle management drive pro module. So overall, we, we say that it is a low co total cost of ownership and uh, uh, and this is uh, the end of my presentation. So <clears throat> kindly let me know anything uh, I need to answer on any thank questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuldeep Varmazi. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, yeah. Sir, my name is Pramod. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there was a change. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pramodji, uh, uh, no. yeah. Actually, the development is required uh, regarding uh, this uh, uh, application of BFD uh, in uh, thermal power stations. Presently, we are using only uh, VFD drives for uh, uh, small motors, small uh, applications. Major applications like uh, BFP or uh, ID fan, we are not using VFD, isn't it? So it is required uh, more uh, development in this uh, field. Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Hello, we can hear you, sir. Achha, achha. Hai. Sir, uh, we can go to next presentation, sir. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, Mr. Ashish. Yes. Yes, I am here. Let me. Felix. Yeah, hello, Andrew. You can start. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let so me know I'm... when you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. So, uh, my name is Ashish Titus. I am a generator design engineer, basically, and working in this field for last 15 years. I worked in various field in various company like uh, BHL, Alstom, and I'm working in Siemens for the last six years. And what I'm going to present is the advanced generator concepts. And this uh, basically we, what we are, we are going to present is the latest technology, what we have developed for these generator maintenance. So this is our standard disclaimer, uh, what we show in every presentation, wherever we present. And this is the basically the three main topics. One is the fast wedgings. Second is the bolted electrical connections. And third is the condition-based maintenance. So I'm going to present the first two topic and the last topic will be represented by my colleague, Andrew Felix. He is from USA. So he is joining us from America. So, this is the present concept for fast wedges. 
uh, you see the wedges basically the application has to hold the slot content in its place and tighten it. So when we do a servicing or over a period of time, this wedges got loose due to mechanical creep edges. So we need to tighten these wedges and it takes a full outages. We need to take out the router and then we need to address these issues. If the wedges are loose, then there is a chance that catastrophic damage can happen. So to prevent those things per periodically, maybe every once in a 10 years, we are tightening these wedges. So what we have developed right now is a concept in which we can tighten these wedges in situ and it takes very less time to install these wedges. Right now, when we are installing the existing wedges, it takes a lot of time because we need to pack the slot content and we need to drive the wedges with some kind of force. And the present new wedges, what we design, we can directly slide it with the hand. So basically below those wedges, there is a ripple spring, which act as a spring to hold that slot content in its place. So this is our new technology, what recently we have developed by years of our India efforts. And the parts which consist in this is, first is the screw, then there is a, a special kind of insert, then the slot wedges, and below it, instead of a ripple spring, we, we put a pressing filler so that we can uniformly distribute the load in the ripple spring. So below that pressing filler, there is a ripple spring, the fillers and the top coils. This is a patented technology and you won't find it anywhere in the world except in from Siemens. And it does not require you to take out the rotor and then address this issue. And there is a lower potential of damaging the core or the laminations because when you insert those wedges, it slides through easily. There is no tightness in it, and because we are tightening it later on with these screws. These are the parts what we have basically using for tightening, and these are all insulation parts. There is no steel parts, no conducting parts is there. All are insulation composite materials, and it to and to qualify these parts, we have done various testings, various FEA analysis as well as practical testing to qualify these parts. And we can achieve a better accuracy than the present wedges. So the tightness is more accurate and we have much of the compliance right now for PSDS installation. And the torque testing we have done, which can allow maximum allowable torque. And so we are taking the factor of safety, enough factor of safety whenever we are designing for each unit. And for each unit, we are doing the FEA finite element analysis to qualify those wedges as, as well as hand calculations. And we are providing some hurricane arms you can see at the top of the screw. This will prevent the anti-locking of this screw. So you won't find the screw getting backed out so these kind of hurricane arms prevents the backing out of the screws. Then these are the proven technologies which was existing in the wedge. We are maintaining the same, except we are installing a filler at the top of the ripple spring. And we have done those FE analysis and we have applied those loads at these locations. You can see at the red dots here. And Practical also, we have tested those FEA analysis and we find that adequate pressure exists every, every time and there is no, no changes from the existing practice. So adequate pressure exists in the slot content and it won't go, th go out throughout the period of the operation of the machine. So this is the, these are the, some of the practical tests what we have done. And, and the best example is the, it saves much of the time. So we are using a G11 NEMA uh, material, NEMA G11 material, and which is Kevlar coated wedges. 
and which gives so much of the flexibility. Kevlar is the same material what we use in bulletproof vests. So, and you need not to put any insulin uh, resin or anything in the slot to hold the wedges in the place or so that it will come out. And for each wedges, we are doing a FE analysis and we're qualifying each and every part. So there is no chance that any of these things anywhere can go wrong. So from material selection to the fatigue test to the physical test, we have done everything. We have qualified each and every component with the test and verification. And years of effort we have taken. Now we have developed a system which can automatically a, a robot which can automatically go inside the stator and tighten this, these screws. You can see here, it goes inside and it tightens the screw automatically. So we need not take out the rotor or do anything. We just install these ro ro uh, robots in the stator slot and it goes and tighten the screw. Earlier, we need to take out the wedges we need to install the fillers, then again drive in the wedges, and we have to do some testing. In India, basically, we do the knock testing. With the sound, we, we can find whether that slot content is tightened or not. But Siemens has come up with different method of, of checking holes, and we can see with the checking holes how much tightness is there. So all those things can be tested with this, these kind of robots. So these are basically the parts of main thing the wedge, a screw, insert, the bottom filler, pressing filler, we call it, and the ripple spring. And basically the summary is we can save a lot, a whole shift of time. This takes around two, two days of time at the site to check it out. Now we can do it in one shift itself. So it reduced this assembly, improve unit availability, and we can do maximum of 10 retightenings over the period of a year, for the period. So this is one of the technologies. Next, uh, I, I was going to, I'm going to talk about uh, bolted electrical connections. So right now, at the end of the coils, the electrical connections is done by brazing. And we have years of experience of, of these bolted connections, but now we are applying it to each and every machine and each and every connections. So the, basically, mainly we are we are doing with the nuclear customers these bolted connections. Nowadays, we are applying with all all the everywhere these bolted connection, even the phase connection, the crossovers, the series connections. Everywhere we are applying the bolted connection, and we have qualified these things with years of effort, and this and with most reliable operate for most reliable operation. So you can see the end of the coils, the bolted connections are there. And if you'll see the cross section of generator, here are the two coils. And at, at the end of the coils, we are joining these two coils with the bolts instead of brazing. So basically what it does is it saves you time. It saves you money. We need a brazing machine. We need personal, specific personnel. We need a testing equipment to qualify those braces. So it saved 24 to 60 hours of critical path time. So whenever the outage is there, it can be reduced if any coils got failed. And we can adopt these kind of bolted connections. It's a high quality, repeatable, and reliable electrical connections. So factors what we have considered while designing is on failure mode and effect analysis, FMEA, what we have done is the joint interface contact pressure, mechanical creepage, differential thermal expansion. And when we are installing this uh, bolted con electrical connections, there, there, there might be chances of the extra weight so we have considered those things, how much extra weight we are adding at the end, and the loosening of hardware during the operation. So, and other things what we have considered is from electrical point of view and operating point of view is the cooling gas, operating voltage, operating current, physical space restriction is strike and creep requirements and short circuit loads. So, you see the design here, there are two coils. We, we are joining those two coils with these bolted electrical connections. And we are we have done the practical 
testing as a, as a, as well as mock up trials how much time is it required how much torque it required and i'm going to go through it so basically electrothermal anal and as analysis we have done how much temp temperature it can sustain what will it will be and the cfd analysis or also we have done how much gas pressure will be and how much temperature it will gen generate then the harmonic analysis how much vibration we will face at the ends and the static analysis as well as model analysis and we are qualified all those bolted joints with hell calculations amount of torque we required to maintain a stable pressure and those kind of stuff so these are the testings what we have done in this some we have installed a mock up trial for this we have installed a pressure sensors thin film pressure sensors and here we have che checking the coefficient of frictions as well as here we are checking the contact resistance and high current so you see here we are install install the thin thin film pressure sensors and you see the result of it the area of contact is quite high so there is no issue with the pressure the amount of torque what what we have apply is adequate and it won't going to go down and it won't going to reduce the contact area so we, then we have done the blue matching we have first we found out that the initial fl flatness of this piece end piece is not adequate we have provided a flatness requirement in that and then we have checked the blue matching of that part and you see the amount of area which is in contact with the electrical connection now then this is the coefficient of friction test so that no amount of slippage can occur over the period of time of suppose we have taken a 40 years of operation of machine so there won't be any slippage or any chance of loosening of those joints over the period of operation and we have taken a factor of safety three times of the actual requirement so we are very safe at at those conditions then we have checked for high current as well as contact resistance test and we look for a sign of local overheating arcing melting relaxation th test whether it it any kind of creepage behavior is there or not for thermal cycle or not and then short circuit test we have done we have done a sudden burst of short high current and we are we are seeing whether it is any kind of arcing or melting is taking place and we have done a measurement of contact resistance with the mechanical load you see this this is a test setup we have set up we have made a dummy bar then we are providing high current from this right hand side and on, on left hand side there is a connection and we see how it operates and we we give sudden burst of short circuit current also and we see how what's the effect on on our electrical connection now then in operation we also check this contact resistance because this contact resistance lead to heating of this this part and heating leads to damage so the contact resistance we found is a very low and basically the the resistance between those two parts are negligible then the same summary what i have to, told that joint is capable of satisfactory electrical for performance at a small small fraction of a specified clamping load without sustaining any damage the thermal cycle showed no loosening of joint joint undamaged by sudden short circuit current burst the call conclusion basically summary is this that right now the market demand says that we need to save time and cost of the outages so this thing saves us both the time as well as cost and we need not employ heavy machineries to install these things so it's a simple bolt tightening procedure we don't need not have any specific expert or personal to do okay. these kind of job and we have proven these technology with design calculation analysis and testing and we have used using we are using high quality materials and there is a proven manufacturing process and 300 and we have last 50 years of experience with these kind of bolted connection and we have kept a significant safety factor so that nothing can go wrong at any point of time 
So from here onwards, I will hand over to my colleague Alandro. Yes. Thanks. Hi. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Yes, uh, this is Alejandro. I hope you guys can hear me uh, well. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm going to cover the topics of um, of uh, condition based maintenance. We have heard so far uh, about two of our uh, product solutions for um, reduced maintenance and improved uh, outage times. Um, this is now more of a service solution concept um, to take better advantage of uh, and, and better decisions when we decide what kind of service needs to be made on a generator. Uh, the concept for condition-based maintenance is basically we're taking uh, operating data from a unit, all the sensors that come into the control system. Um, if, if the plant is connected to our power diagnostic center, we can have access to the operating data. We also have access to um, our vast fleet experience uh, from servicing of our, of our existing uh, fleet of generators. Um, and so we're able to visualize the operating data, uh, compare it to design parameters, design limits, and design margins that we know are present uh, for each individual generator. And if we couple those with our records that we have from manufacturing and from the factory testing qualification that is done, where we instrument generators with uh, hundreds, uh, I think over a thousand uh, measurement points for pressure, for temperatures, for strain, displacement and things like that. And the idea is to be able to um, get a better representation of what is happening on a unit based on its uh, historic operation. So we can trend things, we can monitor things, we can correlate different behaviors and different operating patterns to experiences that we have seen for uh, different damages. And, and that can be channeled to um, provide uh, either um, risk assessments for extended inspection intervals or lifetime assessments, or maybe give recommendations for um, uh, what operating parameters to keep to slow down the degradation of, uh, of uh, specific components inside the generator. And ultimately, uh, this would lead to reduction in customers' um, maintenance budgets and also uh, reduce risk for forest outages. Uh, Ashish, if you could go to the next slide, please. Yes. Um, so this concept of condition-based maintenance is um, valid. It's something we can implement just looking at operating data. Um, however, there's a, a, um, a, a big gained advantage uh, if we are able to couple it with our um, advanced monitoring platform, which is called Gen Advisor. Um, Gen Advisor right now consists of four different um, monitoring products. We have shaft and uh, shaft voltage and and, and current uh, grounding current monitoring. We have um, uh, interturn short uh, interturn short monitoring. So that's basically our the uh, flux probes. Uh, we have stator and winding vibration, and we have partial discharge monitoring. Um, all these different products can be installed together or individually uh, on any given unit. Um, they can be, they are coupled through the uh, Gen Advisor uh, server platform, which in turn can be connected to uh, the Siemens Power Diagnostic Center. Ashish, if you can go to the next, please. Uh, the next slide just adds a couple of examples of what kind of problems can potentially be detected using the different products we have uh, for partial discharge. We have different like delamination, slot discharges, broken connections, anything that produces um, arcing uh, in, inside the generator. And winding vibration can detect uh, trending of uh, dust or, or the dusting and degreasing that occurs in generators. And in, in, in worst case conditions, you know, when there's fatigue cracks, uh, interturn short circuits is any kind of um, um, any kind of short that occurs between the end winding uh, between the winding turns of the generator rotor, and the shaft voltage and current monitor is for long term trending and to avoid maybe erosion problems in in general in the bearings. Next, please. 
Um, so my next slide is basically just talking about our power diagnostic center um, where we can have a remote access, uh, troubleshooting, and, and uh, customer support 24 seven. Um, next, please. Uh, the last slide just shows uh, uh, some of our experience base with Gen Advisor. We currently have it installed in over 200 units all around the world. Um, not all of these applications are monitored uh, by the Power Diagnostic Center. That is a, an additional service, so they can be uh, Gen Advisor can be monitored locally at the power plant or remotely through uh, Power Diagnostic Center. Um, this concludes uh, our presentations. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your attention and we'll be available for any questions. Uh, uh... Thank you, Mr. Alejandro. Uh, uh, Rati, sir, we can go to the next presentation. You are on mute. Rati, sir, we can go to next presentation. Sir, you are on mute, sir. Yes, we can start. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, okay, uh, next is um, we have. Uh, so you can announce the name, sir. Uh, Mr. Dilesh Narayan, Narayan Stack from Stack, Pentelson University for Thermal Power Stations. We can start with. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Is my presentation audible? Is my presentation visible? Uh, not yet, sir. You can share it, sir. We can hear you properly. You can share the your screen, sir. Yeah, I'm sharing. Uh, yeah, is this okay? Okay. Uh, it, it is coming up, sir. Yeah, it is okay. Uh, good evening, uh, panelist members and my dear friends. Mr. Nilesh, uh, sir, request you to share the screen, sir. You have shared the application. I have shared the screen. No, sir, the screen is not uh, visible. Please uh, try to reshare the screen, sir. Now it's okay? Still the same, sir. Uh, good to go, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Good evening, friends. Good evening, friends. Myself, Nilesh Narayan from Stag Energy Services Limited. Uh, the topic given uh, by CIA today is the maintenance reliability of thermal power plant. I am joined by Mr. Rakesh Mishra, who is our commercial head at Stag Energy Services. This is the triad that makes us unique. Uh, what is the triad that we are an engineering giant uh, across the world? Uh, catering to about 1 lakh megawatt across all technologies. Uh, we are also catering to OND practices 
And if you see the ONM practices, the full scope ONM, it is 6500 megawatt. And if you see the ONM management support, it is 3500 megawatt. And third, we are also IT based process optimization company in which we have catering to about more than 700 IT systems. This is uh, the world over uh, location of our uh, main office and our subsidiaries. Like we are in US, we are in uh, Brazil, we are in Botswana, we are in Spain, uh, we are in uh, uh, Germany uh, as our head office is there, we are in Turkey and India, uh, as I've already said. This is the location wise and the uh, business wise. In India, we are at about uh, nine locations. Our head office are at uh, Noida. Uh, we have a ONM site at Batinda, Talwandi, Sabu. We have a regional office at Ahmedabad. Uh, we have an ONM site at Hazira, uh, GSEG power plant. We have ONM site at Lanjigarh, Vizak, Pegadapali, uh, Eastern regional office at uh, Bhuvaneshwar and Tirupura. And also one ONM site of the gas turbines at Kasipur. These are our stag, uh, energy services in their profile. Uh, we are also one of the leading uh, lenders and independent engineers catering to roundabout from 4 megawatt to 685 megawatt power plants. Two transmission line projects uh, we have completed. Till date, we have completed uh, 12 projects in which we have given independent engineering services. We have done asset valuation right from 60 megawatt to 1320 megawatt. Then due diligence study, uh, approximately eight assignments have been completed. We are empanelment in uh, about eight uh, uh, projects still, and we have done up to 500 megawatt projects. Project review and monitoring, uh, we have done for four projects, one gas-based project and three coal-based projects. For commissioning support, uh, we have given 600 megawatt up to coal-based power plant commissioning support, and also for gas-based up to 350 megawatt. If you see the residual life assessment projects, 36 assignments have been completed uh, till date, uh, up to about 210 megawatt. Performance guarantee test, we have done 23 assignments till date. Energy audit, uh, we have done 40 energy audit till date, and it is till 500 megawatt power plant. Baseline mapping and performance audit, we have done uh, of about 100 units, ranging from various megawatts to up to 500 megawatt. These are our uh, business lines, like we are in project services, we are in uh, energy technology services, we are in system technologies, we are in training and services and advisory, and we are in also O&M. As I've already said, we are in empowerment of uh, various uh, power plants. So these are the uh, agencies and government companies in which we are in empanelment. We have done the recognition and uh, accreditation. We have been accredited by leading government ag uh, agencies. These are some of them. And uh, certification we have done, uh, we have got ISO 9001 uh, 2008 certification. These are the projects in which we have done the feasibility uh, report and detailed project report, like we have done in subcritical uh, coal-based power plants, we have done supercritical coal-fired coal -fired power plants, subcritical CFBC boilers, gas-fired uh, projects, and we are also in the renewable scope, like uh, projects ranging from 5 megawatt to 50 megawatt, uh, we have done this feasibility report of this uh, renewable energy projects. As we can see, we are in diverse uh, fuel, like we are in coal, we are in gas, we are in biomass, we are in petco for different power plants in across all across majority of the locations in India from 50 megawatt to 660 megawatt. These are the some renovation and modernization consultancy, we call it uh, R&M, uh, in which uh, uh, various power plants uh, we have done. Some of these power plants, uh, these are as and as, like uh, we are in Koradi, Bandel, Bokaro, Nasik, 
टूटीकरण टीपीएस प्रोजेक्ट ऑफ टेंजन को कोलाघाट वनकबोरी एंड बिरसिंगपुर this project we have done the project management assignments uh, right from 60 megawatt gas base to 800 megawatt coal base power plants these are the power footing power plants in then the project management study for erection and commissioning uh, assignment uh, these are the eight coal based power plants in which we have done the erection and commissioning assignment like toshiba jsw uh, power plant kens energy vs lignite power vardha power starlight lanco hinduja national power corporation and for gas turbines we have done in gsg uh, hml batinda uh, and luna infra pro private limited these are the gas based power plants so these are uh, seven uh, projects in which we are presently doing uh, our o&m uh, services these are coal based and for gas based uh, these uh, some of these are gas based also so total 900 9329 megawatt we have this ondm services presently we are giving in india some are uh, majority are in operation and some are uh, contracts are closed but we are striving for uh, opening this contracts now coming to the core of my presentation uh, i have been giving uh, the presentation on the maintenance reliability of the power plant uh, i call it as the maintainability of the power plant like uh, we i can divide my presentation into six steps the first step is the finalization of the maintenance philosophy and the strategy asset uh, management team formation the third step is segregation of the ident and identification of critical equipments and common system fourth is the implementation of the pro total productive maintenance with reliability centered maintenance centric approach fifth is obsolescence management it's a type of proactive maintenance sixth is single point operational failure it's also a type of proactive maintenance uh, i will dwell more upon the obsolescence management uh, and the pro uh, single point operational failure uh, management on this topic so step 1 uh, i will see that how the finalization of uh, this maintenance uh, strategy uh, we have done like earlier it was 1980s uh, was the focus on preventive maintenance in 1920s 90s and 2000 more focus on predictive maintenance now we are we have gradually shifted in 2000 era to reliability centered based maintenance from reliability centered maintenance presently and the future is for total productive based maintenance in this we have rcm that is reliability centered maintenance plus operations plus safety plus design plus support system not only the maintenance is the core uh, department in which the sole responsibility of reliability lies but it is the responsibility of the whole ondm services including the design and the safety and other support system in which that lies the reliability of the power plant and for that we have seen that total productive maintenance approach with rcm focus is the key towards the future now what is uh, tpm tpm with rcm is that the tpm is a maintenance program which is more or less resembling the total quality maintenance program like we have the total commitment by the top management employees be empowered to initiate corrective actions La life cycle cost of 25 years to be considered tpm also takes a year uh, for implementation it's and i want to strive in this presentation that it's an ongoing process a tpm recognized that the operation team is also a vital contributor to the long term reliability of the plant with an rcm centric maintenance approach so overall plant reliability is ensured on a sustainable long term basis so maintainability is man ensuring the plant reliability on a sustainable long term basis it's not a one month or two month uh, maintainability but it's on a ongoing process and it should be sustainable on a long term basis now what are the advantages of tpm uh, you can have this uh, advantages many advantages are there but some of these advantages are like improved equipment reliability cost and effectiveness on a consistent basis early equipment management system extended life improvised teamwork improvised uh, safety environment system it's a towards a highly innovative and knowledgeable ondm team optimization of spares uh capex identification for right maintenance at the right time for maintainability of the plant capex for the obsolescence 
the management and hiring of the specialized agencies to plan ex and execute the life extension measures or to conduct RLA and RLM, RNM for ensuring 25 years of the service life. Now, how to measure the maintainability of the power plant? If four or five power plants in operation, how we can say that this power plant is better maintained vis-a-vis -vis the other, or the second power plant is better than the third one? It's a matrix of maintenance effectiveness, which is the maintainability. And if you go for a world-class system, the reactive maintenance should be less than 10%. Preventive maintenance should be between 25 to 35%. And predictive maintenance should be more towards 55 to 60 percent. So if we have such types of scaling or metrics in our maintenance measurement system in our power plant, we can say that we are towards a world class system. If you see the Electrical Power Research Institute benchmark for maintenance system, these are the benchmark for scheduled PM compliance, corrective maintenance to PM maintenance, plan maintenance jobs, resource utilization, and other metrics are defined in our uh, EPRI manual. And we have to stick to this. Then only we can say that my plant is better maintained vis-a-vis -vis the other power plant. Now, if you see the TPM, that is the total, uh, total productive maintenance philosophy and strategy, it's in a, on an apex side. It's on the top. Below that, it's the RCM-based practices and system which has to be installed. Below that, condition-based systems has to be installed. And below that, more it's about predictive system and PM maintenance has to exist has to be implemented. Now, why TPM and why not RCM? If you see the TPM, it's a, a powers industry centric. It's an organization base and it involves operation team, design team, engineering team, safety team, everybody. So that any plant maintainability, it depends on the be, uh, better operating factors and better safe conditions. So by following the TPM, you nullify the negative operating factors. Whereas RCM has a limitation that it is more focused on mix of uh, preventive maintenance, corrective maintenance, predictive tools, condition-based monitoring, RCA, like VIVA analysis. But TPM consists of RCM plus the incorporation of O&M synergy within the team so that a better maintainability or better maintenance effectiveness is ensured. And the reliability can be ensured more or less about 98 to 99 percent. Now, in which uh, my presentation suggested we should have an asset management cell uh, within our organization. We will be primarily responsible in executing this TPM process. And we will be responsible for the long term reliability of the plant and will be reporting to the plant head. This is the asset management team formation. Like we should have a asset management team in which ONM engineers are from different departments are there, and this department then uh, access uh, the uh, equipments, does the analysis of the equipments, and do their ranking and the critical assessment of these equipments. The team members would also prepare six monthly and yearly reports recommending the changes in the maintenance cycle for class A, B, C D equipments. Based on this proactive approach, we can, uh, uh, and also the internal audit by experts, we can say that what are the critical equipments and what are the critical findings and what future action we have to do. Now, this is the step three. In step three, what we do, that we classify all our equipments based on the criticality index into class A, B, C, D equipments. Class A equipments are there, in which if the class A equipments are down, the plant generation is affected, plant contract deliverables are affected, the safety of the whole plant is affected. In class B, the ranking is less, the and the critic, it is less on the criticality index. Subsequently, class C and class D are there. Now, what we have to do with these classifications? Now, once the equipments are classified, we can say that the OEM based maintenance cycle, we can reduce for class B and CD. Whereas for class A, we have to do a mix of PM plus the predictive maintenance because these are the very much important equipments. And if it is down, the whole plant generation is affected. So the cost cutting can be more on class B, CD equipments, whereas cost cutting cannot be compromised for class A equipments. So this way we can have a cost optimization maintenance of the power plant 
without compromising on the reliability part. And as I have said, the best maintenance strategy will be corrective maintenance less than 10%, preventive maintenance 25 to 35%, and predictive maintenance 45 to 55%. Now, uh, this slide uh, is a, a slide in which uh, I'm saying that we are comparing against three teams. Against three teams, team A, team B, and team C. Team A is saying that the plant is best and there are no problems at the plant. And the reliability is 98% for first three years, whereas it is going down heavily on the year four and year five. Team B's uh, plant head is saying that team is very good, but Presently, we have some problems. He, he acknowledging some problems, but not the future potential problems. Now, at that, what happens at the year four and year five, my reliability goes down. But team C is the balanced team in which the plant head said that my team is motivated, it's doing good, but we are not complacent and we are striving for future predicted and unpredicted problems. Now, this is the approach is the best approach for maintaining high maintainability of power plant and which we can ensure plant reliability on a sustainable basis that continuously we have to search and strive for future predicted and unpredicted problems. Like presently we are in 2020. Now when my plant was commissioned in 2008, uh, my risk that is R1 which is going to happen in 2022 20, uh, or 2024, uh, that risk uh, was there, but my risk was less. My risk was less. Now in 2020, my risk has become more. So what has happened that this risk, which has become more compared to the risk, which was envisaged in 2008. Now I have to acknowledge this risk. That is R2 is more than R1 and this risk is more dynamic in nature. And if it doesn't, I acknowledge this risk, then something uh, more accident is going to happen or more uh, equipment damage is going to happen. So I have to continuously search for uh, unpred unpredicted or predicted uh, problems which are going to come in 2022 or 2024. And that is the best strategy. That my risk is dynamic, my consequences are static, and I have to continuously search for uh, problems which are going to come in the future. That should be the right approach for any o &M team. Like I have said, uh, uh, segregated at how you have to minimize the lagging factors and how you have to maximize the leading factors. Now this TPM with RCM centric approach means that we have to change the thought process as I have said earlier. Now, what is the thought process that we have to go from conventional to a world-class thought process? Like what is from conventional thought process to world class thought process. Like in conventional processes, we are saying that maintenance reliability is the function of maintenance department. Whereas in a world class process, we are saying that maintenance reliability is a organization wide. Second, maintenance reliability is more than 95%. We are saying that it's a very good score. Whereas for a world class organization, maintenance reliability should be more than 99%. So these are the mindsets in which we have to change as we go towards the future. In conventional good organization, uh, it is more of a condition based, whereas in a world class, we are more on a predictive type maintenance and the TP white philosophy we are following. Maintenance, uh, earlier maintenance was on the basis of recommendation of the OEM and experience guests, whereas in the future, maintenance is based on the OEM plus RCMA approach. Now, if we see the conventional good organization, uh, philosophy is not considering the impact of the obsolescence. Like if we see the instrumentation system or electrical system, they are going to become obsolete in about 10 years or 15 years of life. That obsolescence we have to acknowledge very proactively beforehand. And we have to do an obsolescence management action plan for future. Whereas in the world class organization, they accept the obsolescence uh, and they do the timely action plan. Subsequently, the present spares philosophy in our power plant is mainly based on OEM recommendations and main, minor and major overall, whereas in future spares philosophy should be based on the maintenance requirements, which is coming from the RCA and the asset management cell recommendations. 
these are some of the best practices uh, while we are following the TPM with reliability center maintenance approach. Uh, many of you must be aware of these are the steps, so I doesn't want to go much in detail. This is the last in which any maintenance uh, program has to be implemented enter enterprise wise and asset management system has to be improved. Now, what is obsolescence management? That is my uh, step five. Obsolescence management is uh, mainly there are two types of approach, reactive approach and a proactive approach. Reactive approach for the obsolescence management of electrical and instrumentation system says that reactive approach of a component obsolescence management deals with acting upon an alternate plan once the end of the life or product discontinuous system or last time buy notices are issued by the supplier. Whereas for a proactive approach deals with constantly monitoring and predicting the life of the components used in the product as well as well in advance developing alternate action plans to ensure that obsolescence does not affect the plant reliability. That we in short says the health check of the system has to be done periodically. Now coming to the residual life assessment of the major equipments, we can say that as our power plant achieves about 1 lakh running hours, we have to do a residual life assessment of the boilers, residual life assessments of the turbine. Like in boilers, we have to do present uh, RLA of the pressure parts, pipings, then if there is a, some premature pressure parts failure, uh, what are the reasons for that? Identification of future problems, analysis of root cause of problems, estimation of a balanced life of the pressure parts, and other things. Like in turbine, we have to do RLA tests uh, to be carried out for turbine components like HP module, IP module, LP module, uh, turbine bearings, uh, etc. Likewise, in RLA, we have to do for generators, HT motors, and transformers. These are the heart of the power plants, like boiler, turbine, generators, transformers. These are the heart of the power plants, and RLA is a must for around 1 lakh running hours. Now, as the plant approaches about 12 to 15 years of operation, uh, as I've said, that RLA uh, needs to be done, and uh, capex has to be taken well in advance, and with the RLA, we can say that what is the residual life, which is balanced and what action plans today I have to take so that my machine runs for another 10 years or 8 years. So 25 years of service life is ensured. These are the single point operational failure. I tell it's also a part of the proactive maintenance. Uh, give me two minutes to dwell upon this. What is the single point operational failure? Now, as I have said that I have classified my equipments into class A, class B, class C, class D. But there are some systems or common systems in which it, it fails, the whole power plants uh, fails, like uh, fuel oil systems, feed water systems, steam piping, common equipments, tanks, pressure reducing desuperator systems, headers, etc. So these systems in the criticality assessment is on a higher side. So we have to constantly search for problems in these common systems or a single point failure in which a single point fails, the whole cascading system fails or there's a cascade tripping. So that is also one of the vital element for ensuring the plant reliability on a sustainable basis. Like presently, how we do the plant reliability, we, we have the past precedents. We study the history of the non-performance. Present what we do, present we uh, uh, acknowledge the teething problems presently are there, or what are the future predictor problems. But what is missing in our philosophy that we have to look for some surprise future unpredicted failures or unknown single point operational failures, which may come in the future. This is the challenge for the asset management cell and which we all have to acknowledge and uh, go for for identifying these challenges. So uh, I want to say that uh, single point operational failure is very risky and we have to constantly look after this and TPM is uh, uh, asset management cell, which consists of a TPM team, uh, should also have one external consultant also in which, uh, and they should have a brainstorming session every quarterly and should look out for this single point operational failures or cascade trippings. They should have annual in-house survey, corrosion survey, and other discussions in which we can point point this potential unpredicted failures. In final words, uh, I have to say that my if we go for this modern asset management system in terms of KPI, like unscheduled maintenance, reactive maintenance, maintenance cost, mean time between failure and work order cycle time, this all will come down. 
and there will be a good maintainability of the power plant. My maintenance reliability very will be very high. So this is the business line of uh, stack. Like we are in plant services, we are in OM services, we do asset management services, we are in predictive maintenance, we are in diagnostic study and testing, residual life assessment, RLA, and RNM, condition assessment, energy auditing, performance testing, and commissioning support. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Next presentation. Saksana sir, you can start your presentation. Thank you, Radhi sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, friends. Firstly, I would like to thank uh, uh, CII for giving me an opportunity to address this uh, August gathering for this power plant summit, uh, the 16th power plant summit, and which is being held virtually. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> the topic that I've been given is uh, the role of renewable energy in the power mix. Uh, this is uh, a fairly large uh, topic to discuss. And uh, let me first share my presentation with you. Uh, I hope uh, it's it's visible to all. Uh, Mr. Saktena, please share your screen. Uh, you're sharing the application right now. Share, I've shared the content. And uh, should I say now share? Okay. Share file, share application, share my screen. Okay. Is it, uh, is it done now? Yes, sir. Good to go, sir. Good to go. Okay. Uh, just a minute. I've got a. Yeah. So the topic given to me is the role of renewables in the power mix. Uh, we all know renewable energies, sources of renewable energies is the thing of the future. And uh, we hear a lot more about uh, renewable energy nowadays than we used to hear about 10 years ago. And especially during the last three, four years, this has become the buzzword and this has become the uh, way to go. And uh, so in this in this presentation, we will talk about how uh, renewable energy is gaining so much of importance in uh, the power mix of uh, various countries. Uh, before I start, I think I'll give you some uh, relevant facts and figures. Uh, see the global globally, the share of renewable energy in the total primary energy supply uh, would reach about 63% in 2050, which means 63% of all energy consumed by uh, this planet will be, you know, from renewable energies, which is uh, just about 27% presently, and it was only 14% in 2015. So, you know, in about 30, 35 years, uh, we are going to see a global energy transition, which could even exceed the 63% in my personal view, uh, by the year 2050. India is on the forefront of uh, uh, leading this charge of renewables in the power mix, including hydro, which is a renewable source. Uh, uh, we contribute, uh, renewables contribute about 21% of the total electricity generation in our country. 
and 36 percent of the total installed capacity of about 370 gigawatts in this country today is uh, renewables which is hydro solar wind biomass and others one interesting fact which uh, happened just two months ago in may 2020 is that renewables produced uh, more energy in the oecd countries which are basically all developed countries and a few more a group of top 34 countries in this world if we take the energy generation in these OECD countries in May 2020, renewables produce more than half of all the electricity generation. Now, this happened for the first time. Otherwise, renewable was always less than half, although it was increasing. So we have reached a stage where more energy is being generated in these developed countries using renewables than using conventional methods of uh, conventional sources like fossil based uh, fuel. What is the need for uh, increasing the RE share in the power mix increase? We, we need to understand that. Uh, besides, uh, climate has been the main uh, driving force. You know, climate change uh, actually brought in the necessity of moving away from fossil fuels in the world and look for other uh, sources of energy which do not produce so much of uh, greenhouse gases and CO2 emissions. Uh, there was, uh, in the COP21, in 2015, in the Paris Climate Accord, uh, sought to limit average global temperature rise to well below 2 degrees centigrade within this century. Otherwise, you know, we will enter into a stage of climate catastrophe. That is what was recognized and every many countries ratified this accord and uh, set up targets for themselves that they will achieve uh, what. So, you know, so many countries like India, uh, USA, of course, after Trump came in, walked out of this Paris Agreement, but many other countries are a part of this agreement and are working uh, very actively to increase uh, the renewable energy share in their practical, uh, in, their, in their power mix. We must, uh, we realize that energy-related carbon dioxide emissions represent two-thirds of all greenhouse gases. Thus, this global transition of uh, energy away from fossil fuels is absolutely necessary. Just five days ago, gentlemen, the hottest air temperature was recorded somewhere in USA in the Death Valley in California. Uh, it was 54.4, you can see on the right of the panel, 54.4 degrees Celsius was the temperature on the afternoon of August 16th, just last week, last Sunday. And uh, this is a alarm for all of us that things can become really bad. We are already aware of uh, the uh, ice uh, melting in Greenland and at the South Pole. So recognizing all that, the UN United Nations General Assembly in 2015 had also laid down targets for Agenda 2030, which was uh, subsequent to the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, as we call it. And the key target for this SDG uh, for uh, uh, renewables was to increase substantially the share of RE in the global energy. Besides all this that has been happening in the uh, international agencies, recognition of the climate change and, you know, having goals, etc. Today, we have reached a situation where the cost of energy generation with many renewable energy sources is now lower than the cost of energy generation from coal, diesel and gas. For example, solar PV, which is now the dominant source of renewable energy, the cost of generation is lower than what we can do with coal. And uh, so this gives an opportunity to the oil importing countries to achieve energy security. And this is the case uh, with India too. But time is running out. If we do not change, uh, increase the share of uh, renewable energy in the power mix globally and for many countries, the uh, it will be really bad for all of us and for the future generations so renewable energy needs to be scaled up at least six times faster we need to work much faster for the world to meet the goals set out in the paris agreement coming to india uh, the renewable energy in the power mix in india is basically uh, because india is making energy security a priority the government of india has uh, set up a ambitious target of 175 gigawatts by 2022, which includes uh, 60 gigawatt of wind and 100 gigawatts of solar. 
and beyond 2022 also you know they have said that by 2027 they will actually try to reach 227 uh, uh, gigawatts so another major thrust will be there even after 2022 and i think it will continue so government of india is actually making major investments creating a single national power system they are also trying to integrate systems and make uh, generation more flexible because uh, renewable energy is a variable uh, generating uh, station because natural resources are not constantly available 24 by 7 and uh, like sun and wind are not available all through the day sun is available only till the evening and even during the day it actually varies so the uh, production of energy has to be stabilized and the other sources of energy need to be flexible to fill in when the renewable energy source is down and uh, there are a lot of techniques uh, to do that mm, the government of india is also promoting natural gas uh, gas based in generation and battery storage to reduce so essential for grid stability the coal based plants are also being asked to you know find out ways to operate more flexibly this is some data which will give you the current status of uh, renewable energy in the country the total installed capacity of power plants uh, till 31st March 2020 was 370.11 uh, gigawatts, out of which 87 gigawatts was renewables except hydro, and 45 was hydro, which is also taken into renewable uh, globally. So about 36% of the capacity uh, was from hydro and renewables, generating about 21% uh, of the total energy generation. So this is going to increase uh, every year as we see if we uh, work towards attaining the goal set by the government of India of 200 and of 175 gigawatts of renewable energy. And as you notice in the last column, the renewables uh, have a lower uh, plant load factor or capacity utilization factor because the uh, sun is not available 24 hours. So it's uh, renewables have a mm, CUF about 18%, which solar is about 16.6. So what are the challenges ahead for increasing uh, renewable energy in the energy mix in India? I'm using the word energy mix because uh, it's basically what portion, what part of the energy in kilowatt hours can we generate using renewable energy is what really matters. Solar being uh, the dominant technology today because of the reducing cost of uh, generation uh, with solar uh, most of these things uh, are written in the perspective of solar pv and not uh, may not be relevant for uh, many other uh, generation uh, uh, renewable energy sources so one of the major challenge for solar and for even for wind is uh, land availability and acquisition which is a major impediment to re growth because uh, it's an uncertain cost when you are conceiving a, a project and uh, the acquisition uh, process of identifying and actually acquiring uh, large parcels of land which are required for major projects often causes delay in project execution. Uh, increase in uh, the project cost due to higher import duties on major components. So uh, you must have heard that uh, the government is now imposing basic customs duty and has also extended the safeguard duty on uh, PV modules and cells. So which makes import of these, uh, these components uh, more expensive and uh, the the indigenous uh, production of uh, modules and cells is much lesser than what uh, is actually required for reaching the target of 175 gigawatts so it is it is imperative that people will have to import even if they have to pay more import duties and this increases the project cost uh, there are frequent uh, regulatory changes which uh, have been seen the open access charges etc uh, have been arbitrarily uh, kept changing very often in many states including maharashtra and many other states there have been contract violations by some state governments to change the tariff once the ppas have been signed uh, because if the ppa two years ago was signed at for example five rupees per kwh per unit uh, and after two years, the discom sees that, you know, it is only two rupees 60 pesos or something. 
they would uh, try to renegotiate the PPA tariff, which uh, is actually a violation of the contract. Besides that, there have been delayed payments from discoms. <clears throat> we all know that many state uh, discoms have been delaying payments to RE projects. So all these three factors uh, lowers the investor confidence and project financing, raising funds for projects uh, become very difficult. Besides all this, a new dimension of the coronavirus has uh, taken effect. So there was no activity on project execution for two, three months soon after the COVID-19 lockdowns began in the last week, and week of uh, March. And uh, <clears throat> it has now started. Some projects have uh, now started and ONM activity also in full course has now begun, I believe. But it has resulted in a labor cost increase and uh, because of safety measures one has to take, social distancing, etc., one has to do. It will also uh, take more time to implement the projects now. So all this is going to really increase uh, the cost. So these are the challenges, you know, how to, we hope that we come out of this coronavirus situation uh, sooner than later and things uh, become normal. <clears throat> so in my opinion, impact of COVID-19 on the RE sector, this is the program scheme which MNRE site have taken this data and uh, this is from April to June, which is the first quarter of this financial year. Uh, against the target, you see that the achievement is just about 4% of uh, this thing and uh, which is which is really uh, very less. It should have been about 25% or 30%, but uh, for, for the first quarter and the cumulative achievements therefore have been lower than what uh, were anticipated. We hope that these things will increase and uh, we don't have to reset our target for 2022. Just a recap of uh, whatever we discussed. So the renewable energy sources are rapidly increasing globally and in India, the share in the global uh, in our power mix and energy mix. Solar PV is emerging as the most dominant technology and has gained user confidence uh, because it has been performing. The cost of solar energy from uh, cost of energy from solar PV is now less than the cost of energy from fossil fuels, and the gap is only likely to widen. And government of India is keen to exploit the vast potential of RE technologies in India to reduce its oil and coal import bill and achieve energy security. Many states are introducing RE friendly politic, uh, policies for uh, solar rooftops, etc., and uh, they, to attract investments for solar projects. Achieving the 175 gigawatt target by 2022 could be a challenge because of the COVID pandemic, but the long term prospects for RE and mainly solar PV remain uh, really upbeat, and uh, I think it is going to grow uh, with some uh, urgency sooner than later. COVID-19 has impacted the whole energy sector and RE is no exception, but solar PV shall regain uh, uh, normalcy faster than others due to its inherent advantages. However, the consequences of COVID-19 are difficult to predict. We really don't know how soon we are going to come out of it. So these are the references which I have taken. Thank you for attention, gentlemen. Stay safe and take care. Uh, if there are any questions, you can ask me. Thank you very much. Uh, is uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Rati, sir, we can take some questions, sir. Uh, there are. I'll just I'll just read out the questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this question I think is uh, for the Siemens team. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the allowable contact resistance uh, in generator bolted connection? Uh, Siemens team. Mr. Ashish. Mr. Ashish. Uh, I think there is some 
uh, fa- uh, failure uh, uh, i think uh, they are unable to listen uh we can ask next question uh, uh yes yeah, sir uh uh no further question sir uh thank you yeah only one question was there so we can maybe uh, close the session here sir yes 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 nice condition uh okay thank you thank you sir thank you okay uh, uh thank you all thank you all the speakers uh, thank you session chair uh, for joining um it was really nice presentation from sharad saxena sir uh, nilesh narayan sir and uh, cement team uh, if we have any other questions if the participants write to us uh, uh, we will ask uh, we'll get back to you with the questions uh, thank you and have a nice day uh, remember to uh, visit the uh, exposition area uh, there are some nice companies there you can visit them the next session will start in another uh, 10 okay thank you thank you thank you mehul thank you very much bye